Oregon has had, to put it mildly, a challenging time the last few years. We've got homelessness, trash and graffiti, a rise in violent crime and a decrease in police officers, a big divide between the liberal and conservative parts of the state. We're all having a hard time. So do people still want to move here? What do the numbers show? And a big endorsement for the Portland street response. Data shows a big drop in non-emergency calls to police. City commissioners say they're ready to expand. Here's a story. Ooh, that's a big development to a big story, something a lot of people have been thinking about and talking about. We'll see, we're going to discuss it in just a moment. First, hi, hello, I'm Dan Haggerty. Welcome to the story. This is the show that wants to hear from you. So I want to hear what you think about all these stories we discuss and what else you think we should be covering in the city of Portland, the state of Oregon, the region of the world we live in. So all the ways at the bottom of your screen, you can email me at the story at KGW.com or you can reach out on Twitter. Use that hashtag. Hey, Dan. Well, you might have noticed that it's raining again and rained like all last Last week, uh, most of the time anyway, it got nice over the weekend, but it is raining again now. And if you look at the KGW weather app, it's hello darkness, my old friend. There's rain almost every day. OK, it's just that time of year. It's a time of year in Portland where you think to yourself, did I wait too long to store my blue and white patio rug? I mean, it's soaking wet now. Am I ever going to get enough consecutive days to dry this thing out? Or is it cursed forever? Inviting several passive aggressive questions from my wife about my quote plan for the rug out back. This seems like a good story for the 112, the 112 people who move to Oregon every single day. Now, we use the 112 segment to explain Oregon stuff to people who move here from other places like Southern California and say things like, dude, what is this wetness falling from the sky? And we are officially tiptoeing into the rainy season. But before we talk about that, maybe we should discuss what you are probably thinking, which is, are there really still 112 people moving to Oregon every single day after what we've all been through? It's not a bad point. I mean, we started the segment pre pandemic and a lot of things have changed, but Willamette Week published an article back in August and said, according to the Portland State University's Population Research Center, the city saw a steady population increase through 2020. The numbers for 2020 2021 won't be out until November, so those are coming soon. But data right now seems to suggest that while the pandemic may have slowed Portland's population influx, it hasn't stopped it. The city is growing. And the same can be said for most parts of Oregon. I mean, after all, the people who do leave Portland and many people are living, leaving the city of Portland, considering a lot of the things we talk about on the show, you know, the homelessness, the threat of ongoing protests, the potential for a violent police response to those protests, anarchist vandalism, the trash, the graffiti, the uncontrollable rise in shootings, the extremely high cost of living, etc. But those people who leave the city do traditionally stay in the state of Oregon. Stacker published an article today showing where people in Portland, Oregon are moving to most. Now, the data is from 2014 through 2018, but it does show trends. And you should keep those dates in mind, though. And while the list shows that most people who leave Portland head to Seattle, cities number two, four, six and seven are all Oregon City. So collectively, most people who leave Portland do stay in Oregon and certainly stay in the Pacific Northwest. That said, Oregon's growth is slowing down, which may not seem that dramatic because it is still technically growing, but shifts, big ones, happen slowly. I mean, keep in mind, when the 2020 census was complete, Oregon had grown so quickly over the past decade that we got a new congressional seat. And now, less than a year later, North American, one of the country's biggest moving companies, considers Oregon a neutral state in its 2020 migration report, meaning it's not really growing and it's not really shrinking. It's just kind of stagnant. But it is dangerously closer to the latter. If you consider all the moves in and out of Oregon in 2020, 51% were pe people moving into the state and 49% were people leaving, moving out. For context, when Oregon was booming in 2011, it was 61% moving in and 39% moving out. And in April, the Oregon Employment Department found that Oregon's 2020 natural population increase was the lowest on record. Now, that's a combination of a bunch of different factors, but according to their data, they did show a net migration of about 28,600 people. So people are still moving here, just not as many, at least as compared to the people who are leaving. And after a decade of rapid growth, it will be interesting to examine the effects of a rapid slowdown. All that to say, we still have a lot of new people moving here to the state of Oregon. And all of you need to fully understand this issue I'm having with my rug. At this point, I mean, it's going to need at least two, maybe three days of consecutive sunshine or things are going to start getting funky. 
and there's no guarantee that I'm going to get that. So to help us kind of understand the change of seasons in the Pacific Northwest and what we should make of the rainy season, let's turn to the chief, Matt Safina. First, I have to address the rug because last <laughs> fall, my wife did the same thing. Ah, thank you. Put one out for the pod school, and I'm like, dude, really? It's not. And, and we had to throw it away. It Every got year. funky and moldy. Every year. This year, we had a new one, and I moved it in before it rained. So See? You just got to do You that. learn. I don't. I also did not know we are going to go Simon and Garfunkel on this show. Hey, that was a surprise. I, I, I like that, too. <laughs> and for all the dudes who moved here from California, um, it was raining in Los Angeles, San Diego, up to Santa Barbara yesterday. So they were getting rain and thunderstorms there. This is the sunshine out of the Oregon coast right now. This is the rain situation that we're being, that we deal with as we go into the month of October and through the month of October. So we call October 1st the beginning of the water year. That's just a fancy way of saying instead of going from January 1 to December 31st to count up the yearly rainfall, we'll start that year, the water year, on October 1st and then go to September 30th. And we do that because this really is the start of the rainy season. And if you do it this way, as opposed to the calendar year, you encapsulate one rainy season into your 12 months as opposed to the tail end of one and the beginning of the next if you use the calendar year. So that's one metric of the fact that yes, we are going into the rainy season. Now the odds of rain on any one day during the month of October, if you split it up this way, the first half of the month, October 1st to the 15th, 27 to 40%. So, you know, better than even odds that you'll have a dry day. Not really the story for the second half of October when the odds go as high as 57% on any one day of having rain on that day. And that's just historical data. The numbers prove that out. So we, as we go through the month of October, the odds of getting rain on any given day are going increasingly higher throughout the month and I usually tell people by the time we reach mid October it's game over. It's the rainy season and odds are expect rain as opposed to not and you know today's the fifth so we're close to that right. Um, the rainfall for the month is more than double what it is in September. So if you enjoyed the summer in September and the beautiful weather we had in September, October is a different animal. We still get these great halcyon days where it's going to be beautiful like it will be on Thursday like it was over the weekend. But the rainy season is upon us, and this year it's starting a little early, Dan. Back to you. Uh, say goodbye to my patio rug. Matt Safino, thank you very much. Now, let's talk big story. And the numbers, they are in. And like my hips, they don't lie. I apologize. But seriously, today, researchers with PSU, they sent a message loud and clear to Portland City Council. Expand Portland Street response. Here's Maggie Vespa. It's been more than six months since Portland vowed big changes for its first response landscape. The mission to take police out of the equation on nonviolent mental health and addiction calls and send crisis counselors and paramedics instead. We're the Portland Street Response Team. We're a new program. That's they called it Portland Street Response. In February, they launched it as a pilot in Southeast Portland's Lentz neighborhood. Good morning. Thank you, City Council, for inviting me to present the findings of our six month evaluation. Of Researchers at Portland State University have been studying the program since, and Tuesday, they said the message so is clear. Foremost, our first recommendation is to commit the necessary resources toward the expansion of Portland Street Response to eventually make its services available throughout the city and during all hours of the day. Dr. Greg Townley so with PSU there urging the City Council to go big and take Portland Street Response, or PSR, citywide as soon as possible. PSR was able to respond, resolve the vast majority of its calls in the field. Here are some of the points Townley highlighted, specific, again, to that pocket of Southeast Portland. Since PSR's rollout, there's been a 4.6% drop in total calls for police and a 22.5% drop in police responding to non-emergency welfare checks or unwanted person calls. There's also been an 11.6% drop in firefighters going to behavioral health and illegal burn calls. Commit Commissioners seemed pleased, one in particular. Portland Street response is exceeding our expectations. This comes after Commissioner Joanne Hardesty Monday told KGW she'll be pushing the council to sign off on taking PSR citywide this spring. Here's the thing. She wants the money now. Hardesty wants the council to this month set aside just over a million dollars so PSR can start hiring more staff after the new year. Tuesday's presentation was key to her plan, but 
it didn't come without questions. How are we defining success? Mayor Ted Wheeler has always said he supports expanding PSR, but wants to do it the right way. And Dr. Townley admitted there are some things he'd like to see the program do better. For instance, their call volume is low. 911 dispatchers are only sending them on roughly three to four calls a day. Part of that is because of PSR's criteria. They can't go to calls where someone has a weapon, they can't go into homes or businesses, and they can't go to suicide calls. Changing those rules would involve negotiating with the police union, among other agencies. Townley added data shows in cases involving mental health, many people are hesitant to call 911. Scared police will be sent. In short, not enough people know PSR exists. We went to the Lentz neighborhood Tuesday, where evidence of the housing crisis is easy to spot. And this happened a lot. Had you heard of Portland Street Response? I had not actually. One couple camping here told us they had had an encounter with PSR. They said the staff were kind and they liked the program. I'm not sure exactly where the disconnect is. I also spoke with Sabina Erdis, executive director of the East Portland Collective. She lives in Lentz and agrees the need for Portland Street response is great and the low call volume is bizarre. Still, Erdis is confident the program will pick up steam and she supports the expansion. I have seen them like last time I saw a person in distress walking in traffic barefoot, uh, PSR were already there. So I'm hoping that um, they pass this hurdle and uh, budget is approved to offer them stability and continuity and allow their workers to focus on the actual work. Okay, Maggie, so some hesitation there, but it certainly feels like more of a go than not. I think that's the perfect way to describe it at this point. And we said yesterday that commissioners uh, Mingus Maps, Dan Ryan, and Carmen Rubio are all voting yes on an expansion this fall. So it sounds like this is going to get the votes that it needs. And this presentation definitely didn't change their minds. It was pretty positive. So what happens next? What, what do we look out for? Yeah, so a reminder, this is all part of a regular budget process called the fall bump. They reevaluate the budget during the fall and during the spring. This is the fall bump. So basically all the commissioners submit their pitches for the fall bump to the mayor. He compiles everything and then releases basically an overall budget proposal. And we'll see if this pitch to expand PSR is included in that proposal. That's due out in a couple of weeks. Interesting. All right, Maggie, thanks. Sure. Why don't we count some vaccines real quick? We like to do this every single night just to give you an idea of where we stand. As of this afternoon, more than 2.8 million Oregonians have gotten at least their first dose. That works out to be 66.9% of the state's entire population. Everybody, even kids under 12 who can't get the shot yet with at least one dose. In Washington, more than 5.1 million people have gotten at least one dose of a vaccine, which works out to be 67.7% of the state's population. Players with the National Women's Soccer League say they're not done holding the league accountable for hurting players. I want more. I want more justice. I want better policies. I want players to be protected. But the league's former commissioner says she's proud of the work she did. And sorry to Blazers fans, your options for watching games if you don't have cable just got a lot more limited. We'll explain when the story continues. I'm just laughing during this commercial break, reading questions and comments. I knew I wasn't the only person having a problem with my outdoor rugs in this community. One day you're hanging out on the back porch. Next day you can't get a day to dry it out. It's, it's a huge conundrum. Nobody's talking about this, but we're going to talk about it here. Okay. We uncover rug news here on this story. It's the kind of show it is. Thanks for uh, writing in, letting me know what you want to uh, see covered. Apparently a lot of rug news. Uh, the story at KGW.com is the best email to use, or you can use hashtag HeyDan on Twitter. Also, want to remind you about our Hey Health campaign. We have been really helping out a lot of people in the community with this. All of you at home have been so generous, and this week we're asking you to please consider donating to the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women USA. They're an organization uh, based in Oregon that works to find indigenous women who have a uh, higher likelihood of being victims of crimes. We talked to them earlier this week and they said they've had a lot of attention as people started asking questions about why white women get more attention when they go missing, certainly on a national stage, than women of color do, and that society often forgets about these women. It, it's not a question in my mind at all. 
And right now we're getting a huge public, you know, huge publicity, huge amount of people, you know, uh, news organizations calling in for interviews and things like that. And I'm wondering if it will go away once the issue dies down, you know, because right now people are paying attention and they're horrified. Your donations help them to spread the word about missing Native women and to pay for the basic supplies and needs that their families have when they lose a loved one. If you want to help them out, just open up the camera on your phone, point it at the QR code on your screen. It'll take you to a donation page. You can also go to kgw.com slash heyhelp. This is a micro donation drive, so feel free to give any amount, no matter how small. The world of women's professional soccer is facing a reckoning right now that started here in Portland. Former players with the Portland Thorns, Thorns and others within the National Women's Soccer League say that they aren't going to let up on the league until they feel that the players are better protected. They say players have been abused and been, they've been trying to get the league's attention unsuccessfully about this for years. Last week, The Athletic published an in-depth investigation about former Portland Thorns coach Paul Riley. Former players accused him of coercing them into having sex with him, making abusive comments, sending inappropriate pictures, inviting them to hotel rooms, a lot of very inappropriate things for your boss to be doing to you. The players, Mana Shim and Sinead Farley, along with Alex Morgan, talked about it on the Today Show this morning. He's a predator. He sexually harassed me. He sexually coerced Sinead. And he took away our careers. Yeah. Sinead, how would you answer that question? What do you want people to know about what happened to you? I think it's just really important and why we wanted to share our story and share in so much detail um, the damage that was done um, to our careers, but who we are as people, um, the damage to my self-confidence and how I saw myself, how I approach life, it, it seeps into every part of your livelihood and um, there is a lot of loss that comes with that and things I will not get back. Paul Riley has denied the accusations against him. He was fired from his job coaching the North Carolina Courage after this all came out. He lost his coaching license after it. The players say it wasn't just Riley who hurt him though. They say the entire league failed them when they tried to report Riley back in 2015. When I look back, I tried to be as good of a friend and teammate as possible to Mana in helping her file a complaint when there at the time was no anti-harassment policy in place. There was no league HR. There was no anonymous hotline. There was no way to report. Um, we have now started to put these things in place um, by demand of players, not by being, not by the league being proactive. So th something we ask is for the league to start being proactive, not reactive. We ask for transparency. The league eventually investigated Riley in 2015. They did, and the Portland Thorns ownership chose not to renew his contract because they say he violated policies, but they never made the details of that investigation public, and Riley was hired by other teams. Alex Morgan tweeted screenshots of emails sent to League Commissioner Lisa Baird back in April, asking for her to reopen that 2015 investigation, and that request was disregarded. Baird resigned after the article came out, but she released a new statement saying the incidents happened five years before she began working for the NWSL. She told NBC News she's proud of the work that she did to protect players, including instituting background checks and anti-harassment policies. All right, we don't usually have a, a sports block on this show. We don't do a ton of sports, but I think we're going to stick with it for, ju for just a little while because I know a lot of you don't have cable. A lot of you watch this show and other shows through streaming services. Well, bad news for you cord cutters right now. It's going to be really hard for you to be a proper Blazers fan this season. The new network for the Blazers can't be found on major streaming services like YouTube TV or Hulu. Devin Haskins explains. 15 to shoot. Lillard getting one on the wing. Fade Root Sports wing. Northwest is the new TV partner of the Portland Trailblazers. The team announced the four-year deal in June, ending a 14-year partnership with NBC Sports Northwest. Customers trying to tune into Root Sports on Dish Network were greeted with this screen. 
That's what I get. <clears throat> That's what I get out of it now. Dish said they made an offer to carry Root Sports, but it was declined, saying that they, quote, are demanding rates that would be passed on to nearly every customer, whether they watch regional sports networks or not. Root Sports posted this on their website, firing back. We proposed a very favorable deal for Dish that other large distributors have accepted. Dish Network was only willing to engage on very non-standard terms to continue distributing the networks. Mike Richman is the host of the Locked On Blazers podcast. He says the Blazers will be a good team you'll want to watch if you can find them outside of cable or direct TV. But they're not on YouTube TV. They're not on Hulu, the big, the big service providers. They're on some smaller secondary streaming services like Fubo. Fubo TV replied to a tweet only saying that Root Sports will be available soon. The NBA League Pass is also not an option as the Blazer games are blacked out in our region. We go to overtime. Blazer fans have been here before. In 2007, when the Blazers signed a TV deal with Comcast Sports, which later became NBC Sports Northwest, Comcast was the only option at the time to watch them. Fans launched a grassroots effort to turn up the heat to make the games available to more people. So we're trying to get people to call the advertisers and let them know they're upset, to get them to call the Blazers, because we think the Blazers can exert pressure on Comcast. So it's harder than it's been, um, despite maybe them being in more households. Richmond says he's still trying to figure out how he'll watch the games. When they go on the road next week, It'll be the first time that I have in the 10 years that I've been doing this, not been able to easily watch the Trailblazers. In Portland, Devin Haskins, KGW News. It's an interesting time we live in right now. All right, thanks for uh, sticking around with us tonight. Keep writing in some questions and comments. I'm going to address a few after the break. Email us at the story at KGW.com. Use that hashtag HeyDan on Twitter. See you in a few. Okay, we talked about a lot on the show tonight. Uh, first, I want to get to something from Tom as we were talking about people moving from Portland and going to other parts of Oregon. He says uh, move to Malala. It's, you have the open invite from Tom, who I assume lives there as well. So there you go, Tom. Thanks for the invitation for all the people wanting to potentially pick up from one part of the state and move to another. Uh, as far as my rug is concerned, I do feel like that is a, a, a Pacific Northwest issue. I would like to see some statistics on how many people are annually losing their patio rugs to consistent rain when they think that there's some more patio time to be had and they get a little bit greedy. They get a little bit greedy with that. There's me and then there's Matt from last year. So that's two that I know of. Cheryl has a, has a fix for it though. She said just hang it in the garage. Hang it in the garage, it'll be fixed. Pat also dittos that. Hang it in the garage, three to five days, should be good to go. I don't, I don't fully believe you. I have to get one of those dehumidifiers or something in there, which seems like a lot for a rug, but I might go to that point at this point. Uh, power wash it. Get, a lot of people worry about this rug, probably because you've been in the situation as well. Um, do want to tell you about this enormous QR code that's floating behind me over my, my right shoulder. This is one of those things where you can hold up your phone, and it'll take you to a link, and it'll give you the opportunity to sign up for our newsletter. We talk about how uh, you know people really don't have an opportunity, most people, to watch the news every single night because you're such busy people, and you have your own life to lead, but you do want to keep up on what's going on. So one way to do that is to sign up for this newsletter, and it'll show you all the unique stuff that we do on this show. You're just not going to get on any other newscast in the city of Portland or really around the country. I mean, who, who else is doing this stuff? I don't know. I'm sure somebody is. That's it for tonight. I appreciate it. I'm Dan Haggerty. That's the story. Let us know what you're thinking around Portland. and We'll talk about it on this show. We'll talk to you tomorrow.